Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the first event in Rivers Week. Uh, please bear with us as we wait for people to join us online. Um, I can see some people are already watching, so that's great and welcome. This is being recorded and it will be on YouTube later on to watch. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Mark. Mark, would you like to um, introduce yourself and share your screen, please? I'll do. Brilliant. Yeah. Looks great, Mark. Thank you. Yes. Perfect. Well, yeah, thank you, Sophie, for introducing me. And yeah, good evening, everyone. And thanks for joining me for tonight's presentation on bats. Um, this presentation, I'll take you through the ecology of bats, uh, mostly within the UK, but also internationally. Um, we'll go for a little bit of uh, background information um, all about bats as well. Um, a little bit about me. Um, so I'm a senior ecologist at um, Surrey Wildlife Trust Ecology Services. The ecology services sector is involved with the consultancy side of the trust. So basically, I am heavily involved with conducting professional surveys um, for all protected and notable species uh, to support planning applications. Uh, also involved with biodiversity net gain systems as well. Um, and I design mitigation measures and enhancement measures as well uh, to support uh, development proposals and also other means as well. Um, so to put everything into context and how wonderful bats truly are um, and their general diversity as well, is that there's over a thousand species of bat worldwide. Now these range from the very small bat species um, all the way up to our much larger bat species that are found not here in the UK or Europe, but uh, mostly out in Africa and the Far East. Our smallest um, bat uh, on planet Earth is the butterfly uh, bat. This is as little as two grams. It can be found in Myanmar. And this actually ranges up to the largest bat species in the world, being the golden crowned fruit bat. The wingspan of this species can reach up to five foot. Um, in fact, one individual was almost six foot, I believe. Um, so a very, very large species. Um, now it does vary between uh, species and time of year as well, but the species across the world um, can be living as individuals, uh, live fairly solitary lives, um, but they also can uh, roost together in very, very large colonies. Uh, just to put in context, so the largest colonies um, that we can find in the UK are from our soprano pipistrel bat, a species that I'll be talking about later in the presentation. They have been found up to 2,000 bats um, within roosts here. And then we do have um, Mexican free-tailed um, bats over in the Americas. Uh, their record colonies are 20 million, um, so a, a little bit more, <laughs> um, but it just shows how, um, how many uh, bat species there are across the world and also um, their pure concentrations and distribution as well. There are two main groups of bats um, in the world, um, otherwise known as orders. So the first order we have is Megachiroptera. In this, in this order, we have mostly our fruit bats. So the one I mentioned to you with the five foot wind span in the Philippines, um, that's in within the Megachiroptera. They're mostly found in, or in terms of like Megachiroptera, mostly found in Southern Africa and South Asia as well, and also Australasia and the Far East. Our Microteroptera, which is the other order, we find most of our bat species within this order. They have a pretty wide distribution. They can, they're spread throughout the Americas, um, in Africa as well, throughout Africa, throughout most of Europe, same with Asia and also Far East and Australia. Most of our species in the UK um, fit within the microchiroptera, um, so the echolocating bats, um, which I will be talking about later in the presentation as well. We do have a couple of bats in the UK, horseshoe bats, that do fall within the megachiroptera, um, but they, um, they're just two anomalies really, in terms of kind of uh, compared to the rest of our species in the UK. 
So protection of bats in the UK, we have 18 species here, uh, 17, 17 of which have been confirmed as breeding. Uh, they are protected under two main forms of legislation in the UK, and that's the Regulations Act in uh, 2017, and also the Wildlife and Countryside Act in 1981. Um, all of our, well, most of our bat species as well are listed under, under the species of principal importance. Um, this is under the, the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act 2006. This is not a legislative order. It's a, it basically puts a duty or emphasis on planning authorities uh, and also trusts um, to add enhancements to sites, um, to reserves, et cetera, um, for species listed. Um, in this in this act. It's not just bat species that are listed under this, um, quite a, a few other mammal species, birds, insects in the UK are as well. So in terms of legislation, what, did that, what does that mean for us here? Um, so it stops us from a deliberate capture of these bats, um, injury and killing, uh, deliberate disturbance, uh, damage or destroying uh, breeding sites or even resting places as well. And it also uh, covers uh, intentional and reckless action. This uh, basically uh, gives uh, supports my job in terms of legislation because I'm doing these surveys to avoid any breach of legislation and also to conserve the conservation status of bat species across the UK as well where possible. So to the interesting stuff, um, the anatomy of bats is incredible. If you can imagine your own hand with extended fingers with large membranes between those fingers, that basically comprises of the bat wing. The long fingers that they have, um, the membranes that stretch between the fingers is very um, adaptable to situations. So it does stretch, um, it contracts, this enables the bat to move um, very, um, very skillfully in the air. It can, it can hover, well, some of our species can hover, they can travel very fast in a straight line, they can go up and down, making them probably one of the, the best arboreal or air foraging or commuting species that we have in the world. You can see there the equivalent of our thumb. So their thumb is significantly smaller than the rest of their fingers. Uh, this thumb is used um, for crawling. It's also used for keeping themselves into roosts, which they select, um, and also uh, sometimes hanging as well. Um, in terms of the rest of the anatomy, um, I'll go through it as well as we, through the presentation, making reference to this diagram. So, a few of you may be thinking that um, bats are, in fact, blind, um, mostly due to the famous saying, but actually there are no, no bats in the UK are completely blind. Some of our bats have worse sight than others. So for instance, our horseshoe bats have probably the worse eyesight, um, but can still can see uh, vaguely. And that brings us to, on the opposite end of the spectrum, the uh, pipistrelle bats and long-eared bats. Uh, they actually have quite a good level of eyesight. In fact, they can quite easily crawl around uh, without using echolocation um, between habitats um, and also their roost locations as well. Um, so smell, they do have a sense of smell. This really goes in combination with their main attribute, and that's the use of echolocation. Um, so echolocation, as I go on to the next slide, the way that echolocation is created is forcing a amount of air through the larynx of most of our bat species to a point where it creates an ultrasonic boom. The waves from the ultrasound are then pushed through the mouth or the nose to create those waves, and those waves then bounce off um, hard surfaces uh, to let the bat know um, whether it's colliding with a concrete wall or not, um, used for navigation. Um, they also use it to 
uh, find the prey as well. The echolocation, uh, as it hits the surface or wherever it may be, it bounces back. The waves aren't as powerful as the ones that go out, but they are powerful enough to then reach the bat and they pick this up through their ears. The ability of creating ultrasound is such a really high energy action. For any species that's going to create such a high energy input coming out of their mouth will actually deafen them. But bats have a unusual ear muscle that stops the deafening. So as they are emitting the ultrasound, the ear muscles come into action and they, they stop the, the you know, they reduce the likelihood of deafening. Uh, which is a, a real, really, really interesting uh, fact of um, most of our echolocating bats. Now, I'm not sure whether there are any bat experts amongst the, uh, the audience there, but you'll note that this bat in the picture is not actually from the UK. In fact, it's not even in the microteroptera, as I mentioned earlier, the echolocating bats. It's in the megateroptera, and this doesn't use echolocation mechanism as um, through the larynx. They, they basically click, um, click their tongue. It's one of very few fruit bats that use this uh, method of detection. So foraging, um, yeah, kind of foraging ways. Um, there are four foraging techniques that bats use. Um, this is gleaning, aerial hawking, trawling and perch hunting as well. The list that you see there uh, lists all the species that we have in the UK, so the 18 that I mentioned, um, and 17 of which breeding. The gleaning methods are, the, the process of gleaning is basically taking insects or um, whatever the chosen prey source is, whether it's beetles off the surface of um, leaves, trunks, even the ground as well. This is used by species such as long-eared bats. Again, pictures I'll be showing later in the presentation. They will, once they detect their prey source, they will land on trunks and actually crawl around uh, in search of their prey, not always taking it um, straight from the air. We have the aerial hawkers that do take their prey uh, straight from the air. So uh, quite a few of our bat species do this. Natteras do, um, our pipistrelle bats do and also noctules. Uh, noctules are one of our larger bat species and they will basically fly in one straight line fairly high up. If you have a bat detector, you'll be able to pick them up and you'll be able to see them foraging at least 20, 30 meters sometimes up in the air, flying and in search of usually hawk moths. Hawk moths do fly fairly high. And there are a group of moths um, that through the process of evolution have created an ability within their ear systems of detecting um, echolocation from bats. So once detected from the noctules, there are a certain group of these um, uh, moths that will fold their wings back and plummet from the air down to earth just to avoid capture. Now, being bats, bats are very skillful foragers, so you will see that noctules quite often do end up catching them, unfortunately. You'll see them flying in a straight line and suddenly dropping about three metres, and that's them uh, catching, or at least trying to catch the, um, the moths that are falling. Now there's trawling. So this brings in the world of our rivers, the whole purpose of this week being rivers week. We have a number of species uh, that are heavily reliant on riverine systems, one of which is called a Dorbenton's bat. Now the Dorbenton's bat has a very uh, adaptive way of um, catching its prey. They have an extended calcar that basically stiffens their tail membrane and they have large feet in order to pick up insects from water surfaces. I do have a picture later in the presentation as an example. Um, so I'll show you that later. Um, they will, yeah, they'll quite literally just um, create a little basket and pick the invertebrates up off the surface and then eat on the wing. 
In terms of the types of water bodies that they do forage on, uh, they don't tend to forage along white water, um, kind of rough rivers or very, very fast flowing rivers, mostly because the, the noise from the waves um, interrupts with the echolocation, um, but also a general vertebrate um, concentrations, not quite as high as slow moving rivers um, and also um, lakes and ponds. They tend to like uh, very smooth surfaces um, to actually um, yeah, take the prey from the, from the surface. And that leaves us with perch hunting. Not many of our bat species use perch hunting as a, a method, but our horseshoe bats do. Now, unfortunately, we won't, be, we won't come across horseshoes uh, in Surrey. They have been recorded. Um, and the nearest roost is over in Sussex. Um, but because their numbers are so limited, it's very unlikely you ever detect one uh, on a, a bat walk in the local area. You have to go over to the west to actually get an increased chance of finding um, the horseshoe bats. So we have two species, the lesser and greater horseshoe. And as a foraging method, they will quite often hang from branches and echolocate from the branch. And once they detect a prey source, they will release themselves from the, the perch and fly away and go and catch what they need to. Um, there is another um, unusual method used by the greater horseshoe bat, and that's mostly associated with gleaning, is that they forage over pasture lands. They can, they forage and look for dung beetles. Um, so they have been found um, taking dung beetles from cow pads. So you can imagine how dirty that action of foraging is, but interesting. So this diagram gives you kind of a general idea of where some of our bat species in the UK do forage and like to forage. So I've already mentioned our nocturnal bats, they tend to like kind of open, open habitats. They will forage over big um, wide rivers as well, and um, also smaller rivers and lakes and ponds. Uh, Long-eared bats are very slow moving um, bat species. They will tend to forage in dense vegetation, um, usually in woodland, um, along, um, along hedgerows as well, because they are such small, uh, slow, um, flyers, mostly because of their short wings and broad wings, they can indeed land and catch their prey, like I mentioned earlier, and also fly between all the, the various branches and dense vegetation within, within woodland, which makes their foraging um, abilities um, pretty, pretty skillful. So natteras are one of our myotis species. Um, they will forage um, fairly low down, um, again, very much like our long-eared bats, they will forage in kind of dense areas of vegetation as well. Down at the bottom there, I mentioned our door bentons and our common pipistrels, which are, if you ever see bats flittering around in your back garden, it's more likely than any other species to be a common pipistrel or a soprano pipistrel. They're very fast and agile hunters, they're aerial hawkers. So people will usually catch um, invertebrates in the air, uh, not necessarily landing to capture them. And we also have um, a different group of uh, myotis species as well, which do often uh, forage within dense um, woodlands as well. Generally speaking, uh, most of our bat species will be using uh, woodland and hedgerows, well-connected habitats. Um, open habitats are more you, they're more likely to be used by a, a smaller number of our bat species. But as soon as you come across woodland and um, uh, rivers going through the woodland as well and hedgerows, then that becomes increasingly important for bats, particularly if there's no light spillage as well. So I noticed that there's a bat walk um, going tomorrow evening. Um, so for those of you that haven't done so uh, in the past, um, it's always worth getting a bat detector. There are a number of uh, different um, bat detectors that you can purchase. You can get them from Amazon, you can get them from 
NHBS um, links we are provided at the end of the presentation to make it easier for you. Um, back calls um, mostly cannot be heard through human ears. We can hear up to about 20 kilohertz, the lowest foraging um, echolocation from a bat is from a notchel, which is usually around about 1920. So you can hear them, but mostly if you're of a, kind of in a younger generation. Um, I, at the moment, can't hear notchels, so maybe that's because I'm just getting too old to hear them now. Um, but you can also hear, if you do hear clicks from certain bats in your back garden, they won't necessarily be foraging clicks, there will be social calls. Um, social calls, um, particularly this time of year, actually. Um, if you do hear them, um, it's because you can, and they're usually around about 12 to 15 kilohertz, so well within the reach of our abilities of hearing. The bat detectors that are available to you, like I said, there's quite a number of them. The one on the left there is the little red device, and it's called an echo meter touch. The echo meter touch, um, it does come at a bit of a price tag, but I can tell you from first experience that it's well worth the buy. It's a system that we use in the ecology services sector, so for my professional, professional job. You can connect this to an iPad and the two work together. So you download an app and whichever bats fly past you, the app, depending on its sensitivity, will auto ID some of the bats for you. So actually, it's a very, very interesting device to have. It will show the actual call itself. So when the echolocation gets detected by the detector, um, it, usually, it basically compresses the ultrasound call into what's known as a sonogram. And the shape of the sonogram, you can identify uh, different species in the UK. Um, like I said, you'll probably end up having to get an iPad as well. So if you have one already, that will definitely help. I do hear that um, echo meter touches are now compatible with Android as well. Um, so you can purchase them for other, other devices as well. You can buy cheaper devices. So the one on the right here called the Baton. Um, it's a fairly cheap device, definitely compared to the echo meter touch. It won't necessarily identify the species for you, um, but you can definitely appreciate the sound of back calls uh, through this device. So to our bat species, like I said, we have 18 species in the UK, 17 of which breed. The first group, which I mentioned earlier, um, notably our more common species, are this little chappy. Um, he is a common pipistrel. Um, we also have soprano pipistrels as well, which don't differ too much from the uh, common pip that you can see here. It's usually from colour and uh, wing membrane uh, patterns. You can identify the species. So in the hand, it's quite difficult to identify between the two. Not that you ever be able to um, ever get the chance of handling them but through your bat detectors, they have their own uh, different frequencies. So you can identify bats through different frequencies. Um, for instance, the common pipistrel calls at 45 kilohertz and the soprano pipistrel calls it consistently at 55 kilohertz. So in terms of the calls, they're fairly easy to identify and identify between the species. We do have a third pipistrel, it's called an enthusiast pipistrel. Not a lot is known about this species. It's thought to be quite an uncommon bat. Um, however, there is a nationwide um, survey, a research survey going on at the moment that's looking into the distribution of these species and also finding out um, if they migrate. It's recently been found out they do migrate between the UK and mainland Europe. One, in fact, has recently, in the last two years or so, has been ringed in the UK and captured in Central Europe. So just to prove the distance that some of these bats can actually fly. Um, in terms of our other bat species and their migrating routes, not a lot is known by it, uh, about it. Um, there's a lot of research going on in bats at the moment. As you can imagine, it's uh, not the easiest uh, species routes to be um, researching given its um, activities during the night and also um, the small, uh, low weight of them as well. 
Um, Pippa's trails will, in terms of where to find them, um, you'll, they do roost in buildings. So quite commonly underneath tiles, as you can see, this guy's just coming away from underneath the slate tile. So they'll quite often uh, roost between the tile and the roofing membrane that lies underneath it. Um, they, you can find big colonies of them in these sort of crevices. Uh, wall cavities as well, you can find them in. Um, gaps underneath ridge tiles as well, um, and also in, in chimneys. So soprano and common pit perhaps are uh, two of our common species, but the other bat that's also um, almost as common is called the brown long-eared bat. Now this guy is a brown long-eared bat. There are two species of long-eared bats in the UK. This one's the more common of the two. They will roost in often in like similar uh, crevices as pipistrels do within buildings. Uh, they'll also roost in trees as well. Um, they do have, have a bit of a preference to open roof voids as well. So in loft voids, um, they'll quite often uh, roost up um, in the ridge boards as well. Um, and yeah, that's where I've been finding quite a few of my roosts recently. And again, I've got a picture later on that I can show you. The other bat, a long-eared bat that we have is called the grey long-eared bat. The grey long-eared is very regionally restricted. It's only found in, along the southern coastline, um, so around Dorset, uh, also over in the Isle of Wight as well. So the likelihood of coming across this bat species is, is, not, is not very high. But the long-eared bat is definitely a bat that you may come across during your bat walk if you are doing so. Uh, later on in the week. Barbastel bats. So they are a less common bat species. You won't very often come across them during your bat surveys. Um, however, if you do, it's all very exciting and they are a fairly easy species to identify, um, especially if you've got uh, one of the echo meter touches, um, you'll be able to pick out quite a distinctive call um, from this Barbastel. They tend to be more of a light sensitive species. So they don't spend a lot of their time around urban habitats. So you won't often find them within residential estates or anything like that. It's mostly um, well-established woodland. Um, they will use rivers as well uh, for commuting corridors. In fact, lots of our um, bat species do use rivers as a linear feature to follow. Um, these guys will less commonly roost in buildings, but more commonly in trees, uh, particularly loose bark actually has been um, found roosting, roosting underneath. They are more of an unusual looking bat compared to our others. Um, they all, they're described as a pug-faced bat, which is a little bit unfortunate. Um, you can see there the, the eyes basically sit into the base of the ear, making them look very much like uh, pugs. Um, but I think they're personally very adorable. So as for the remaining of our bat species, I mentioned the nocturnal bat earlier. So the one that dive bombs after all those uh, the diving moth species. This is the nocturnal. I, um, this one we found with, sorry, bat group actually, not far from here, uh, just down the A3. We were checking some bat boxes and found about nine or ten of these bats uh, roosting within the boxes. This one wasn't particularly happy about being handled. Um, they are a, a bigger bat um, than our um, pipistrels and our brown long-eared bats. The wingspan of this bat uh, can get up to about a foot. Uh, whereas you compare that to the bats I've just described, uh, they're around about half of that quite easily. So it is a, a much bigger bat, um, a more common bat species. The other large bat species, we do have two others. Um, one called a Lysler's bat, which is very similar to this guy, but has a furry, a very long furry mane. And they, they are less common. Um, you will find them within buildings occasionally, uh, but more often roosting in trees, very much like uh, the nocturnal bat here. 
Notules don't very often uh, find them in buildings, um, yeah, more often in trees. The final bat, large bat, is our serotine uh, bats. We're quite lucky in the southeast because we do hold quite a large concentration of them compared to the rest of the UK. Um, they are a similar looking bat um, to this one, slightly smaller, uh, slightly darker as well. If you do want pictures of them, then I'm quite happy to provide um, some pictures of them. They're quite um, a distinctive bat when it comes to recording them as well. They do have a, a different call, um, lower kilohertz than our pipistrelle bats. Unlike the lysers and notural bats, serotines will roost in buildings, um, quite commonly so as well, but they would also roost in trees. So I mentioned earlier um, about the Dor Benton's bat and rivers. This is quite a, it's quite a famous photo taken. This is actually a photo supplied by the Bat Conservation Trust. And it really, the picture on the right that is, it really gives a good example of how the Dor Benton catches its prey along the surface of the river. You can just about make out whatever that is on the, the water surface. Um, I think it might be a mayfly. And you can see the bat using its extended tail membrane and its large feet to swoop that um, prey item um, just up from the, the water surface. So this guy falls within a small family group um, in the UK that is called myotis species. Um, we do have other myotis species as well. They're more commonly found within woodland. They will again, um, like very much our other bat species, are using river corridors as well. They, the myota species are very similar looking bats. They're, they have their own particular features of identification. If you ever are interested in seeing bats in the hand, um, sorry, bat group do, maybe not this year, but potentially next year, they'll be holding, um, yeah, just a few kind of um, trapping sessions to show show people or members of the sorry bat group of what bats look like, and I'm sure they'll be more than happy of doing so as well. Um, we do have um, the other myotis species as well, so we have smaller myotis species, so three uh, small myotis, um, smaller than that of the natteras and the Dor Bentons, and we do have one single specimen of a myotis called a uh, mouse-eared bat. Now, there's only ever been one that's been recorded in the UK. That's the 18th bat that I was mentioning to you that hasn't been recording as breeding in the UK. Um, I believe that it does have a name. I think it might be called Bob. I'll stand corrected if there's someone in the audience that can tell me. Um, but yeah, they're not a commonly encountered bat in the UK. This leaves us with the horseshoe bats. Now, I mentioned that um, we're very likely to find horseshoes in this end of the country, more so in Cornwall, Devon, Somerset, South Wales, West Wales, um, south of Birmingham as well. The I fortunately um, was brought up in Somerset and my first consultancy I worked for, we pretty much every bat survey in terms of bat activity surveys, we found horseshoes, which was a real experience. Um, and this one in particular, so the bat there on the left is a greater horseshoe bat. They will quite stereotypically hang upside down. Um, the same with the lesser horseshoe, which is the, the, other, the other horseshoe species that we have, which is of course smaller than the greater horseshoe. They are not the most attractive of bats, <laughs> unfortunately. They have a leaf-nosed um, shape to their to their face. They do have quite a, an unusual method of uh, echolocation compared to others, um, but they are a very peculiar and wonderful species to encounter. They're, when you listen to bats through the bat detectors, particularly through a system called heterodyne, you'll hear the difference between the horseshoe bats and any other species. Horseshoe bats will sound like the theme tune to Doctor Who. They are very unusual. And if you ever get the chance, just listen to a, a call from a horseshoe bat on um, the Bat Conservation Trust website. Um, they'll give you a good example of what these guys can actually sound like. 
Um, like I said, I was brought up in North Somerset. This one I took a picture of in a set of mines underneath the Mendips. I went with the Somerset Bat Group and this one was hibernating. They're found to hibernate in caves mostly. And during the summer period, they're more often found, not necessarily in the caves, but they will roost in old buildings. So old um, farm buildings with large lofts with easy access. Um, so yeah, not so much like our crevice dwelling species, like our pipistrelle bat. So you won't find this horseshoe bat wedged into a small gap. It would much rather hang in an open space rather than anything. So I mentioned uh, where our species tend to roost. Now, the main roosting location for a lot of our common bat species are actually buildings. Um, there are a lot of buildings in the UK, as you, as you well know. Um, again, it's a part of my job to do surveys of buildings before they're demolished to see if there are any bats in there. I've experienced lots of bats roosting in different locations within bats. And this diagram shows you um, what sort of features that bats, particularly common pipistrels, sopranos and um, brown long ear bats roost in. They, like I said before, they'll roost in crevices between the, if there's a gap leading up behind a roof tile, they'll follow it up between the roof tile and the roof membrane. Uh, brown long ear bats will also roost in the crevices, but they more often like open voids. Um, cellars as well um, are fairly good depending on the access. So you can see number 26 there at the bottom. If there's good access into a cellar and it's quite cool down there, um, it does actually provide quite a good level of hibernating suitability. Hibernating bats tend to like a stable cool temperature rather than a warm temperature that the, the maternity colonies like during the summer. Um, other features as well include hanging tiles. If you've got hanging tiles and you see gaps underneath the hanging tiles, as long as they're safely and safe and secure, I wouldn't go replacing them. Hanging tiles are very commonly used by roosting bats, particularly again our pipistrelle bats. Um, in fact we've got um, hanging tiles on our building here and I'm I've been looking for a long time and I haven't seen any bats roosting in there, but I'm pretty sure that they are because the number of bats, in the, sorry, the number of buildings that I have assessed um, and the number of bats I found under hanging tiles are second to none when it comes to any of the other features. But yeah, it's just worth kind of noting uh, what sort of crevices provide suitability for your bats. And, you know, instead of repairing uh, roofs, if if it is going to be a problem in terms of leaking, um, then it will be worth getting uh, contacting the Bat Conservation Trust. If that's if you're not going for a planning application anyway, it'd be worth getting to cut touch with the Bat Conservation Trust just to check that there aren't any bats there before you do re-roof. I mentioned earlier about a nice picture that I took about brown long-eared bats. Um, so this was a building just down the road, a nice open loft space. Um, this one didn't actually have lining uh, underneath the tiles, but they did have nice exposed beams. Um, and if I found a maternity colony of brown long ear bats. The ones that you can see in the picture here are all juveniles, very inexperienced on the wing, um, as experienced when I was in the loft space. Um, I did enter the um, loft space as a monitoring um, method um, to support a, a bat license through my work. Um, it's worth mentioning that uh, you need a license in order to enter a bat roost or disturb a bat roost. So if you ever concern that you do have bats in your loft, um, don't go into your loft knowing that there are bats because that in effect without a license is committing an offence. So just be aware of that, but if you contact the BCT they'll be more than happy forming you uh, going forward if you have any concern of bats, bat presence within your buildings. Um, the owner of this property um, loved his bats. He just, he wanted all the best for his bats. He had a beautiful building. Um, it really was a very, very big building with a really large loft space. And 
he had these guys and he's had them every year with strong uh, maternity colonies of up to about 15, which is quite a, a big roost for BLE anyway. Um, yeah, it's a, a, priv a privilege to see them and to have bats in your building um, is always very interesting. So bats do roost in caves. Uh, this is the mine that I found the greater horseshoe in. The, so in terms of hibernation, um, bats do need a good level of uh, humidity and moisture. So a lot of our mines and rivers, as you well know, are the source um, of some, um, some of our rivers. And the rivers do go flow through the caves and through the mines like this one. And it provides such a good level of humidity and also uh, maintains a stable core cool temperature that's considered perfect for hibernating. Uh, we found uh, lots of horseshoes in this tunnel, but we also found other bats as well. We found myota species, which I mentioned earlier. So our naturist bat, the one on the left um, in the previous slide, um, was found just, yeah, just a number of them just roosting between the cracks mostly in the, in the caves. Um, other uh, potential uh, roost locations are trees. Um, most of our bats uh, do roost in trees because trees have been around a lot longer than, than buildings. Um, buildings are almost like an instant replacement um, of trees. There are very few around anyway. Trees, the good thing with trees, they do provide a lot of diversity in terms of types of roosting opportunities. Um, they have um, cr small cracks within um, trunks that are suitable for pipistrelle bats. You'll find uh, woodpecker holes that are also used, for ba um, used by bats. At the base of trees, the base of trees, uh, particularly younger trees, do suffer from um, frost cracks. Now, this is where the young tree suffers from a, a, an it, um, yeah, suffers from a frost injury and it's where the tree hasn't got time to recover and um, to actually completely seal the damage from the frost and the gap then extends from the base of the tree all the way up the side of the tree. Now if you are on Facebook there's a group called um, UK um, Habitat Bat Tree Group, um, also UK Bat Workers as well. They show videos, uh, licensed bat workers have been using endoscopes to look up into these crevices and mostly often frost cracks as well and people have been finding uh, brown long-eared bats and uh, pipistrels and myotis bats up in these regions as well. Um, so yeah like I said trees particularly mature more mature trees usually um, do provide a good diversity of roosting opportunities. There are different types of roost. So I mentioned like the location of a lot of the, the roosts of our bat species, but there are different types of roosts. So you have everything from maternity roosts um, through to hibernation. You also have feeding roosts. Um, so these are um, a good example I came across the other day actually was an open barn, um, a, a open exposed bean barn where brown long ear bats were just foraging in there. Um, it's not necessarily all the time for the invertebrate assemblages within the barn, but also actually it's a very good method of shelter from predators. The main predator after um, cats are tawny owls. Tawny owls are quite very good um, aerial predators. They will catch bats on the wing but also they do often sit at the base at the entrance of uh, roosts, just waiting for the bats to come out and they do pluck them away. Um, but yeah, so it, just to note that I won't go through every different type of roost, um, but there are a number of roosts depending on the type of year. The life cycle of bats. So as expected, uh, over the winter period, like December through to February time, our cold, coldest months, bats will be hibernating within different roost locations, whether it be a cave, um, they also do roost in buildings as well. They 
Although it's the hibernating period, you would expect the bats to never um, be active at all because they're uh, reserving all their energy stocks. But in fact, bats have been recorded every month of the year. Now that's mostly down to our cool temperatures that we have, uh, sorry, the um, warmish temperatures that we have um, in, the, in the winter period uh, during kind of more warm evenings in December, January, February, bats will take the opportunity of restoring um, their prey. Um, so they will go out, um, whether it would be catching um, hibernating peacock butterflies, or they would often, if there's a river going through their, their cave, they will use the river to hydrate as well during this period. Now, after the winter period, um, that leads on um, through into kind of the more active period, going from March all the way through until October. Now, at the beginning of the season, um, the females will start congregating into their maternity colonies, uh, usually in kind of April, May time. Um, so May, they, the females are pregnant uh, within their maternity roosts. In June, July, the young are born. Um, and then eventually, after three or four weeks, they do become, they do um, uh, develop, their, develop the use of their wings. And they end up just uh, being more aerial born than anything and practice, practice flying. And then that moves on into our September, October period, which is the mating period for our bat species. And then before the mating period, that's uh, just after the mating period, that's when they go back into, into torpor for the hibernating period. But yes, just a, a good little circle for you to just concentrate on and just give you an idea of the, the general activity of bats throughout the year. So I mentioned breeding in the maternity colonies. So as I said, they mate in autumn and winter. They do have a delayed fertilization. So this is to avoid um, giving birth during suboptimal times of year, so very cold times of year. They don't want to be giving birth to a young, a youngster when there's a very few uh, prey items around. Um, so they will go through the process of delayed fertilization. As bats aren't the only ones that do this. Uh, badgers do, uh, quite a number of other species do as well. They then, once the delayed fertilization process is over, they will then ovulate spring and then become pregnant. And then the birth occurs between 40 days and six months after the egg begins to develop, which goes in line with our um, breeding um, activity circle in the previous slide. Each bat will give birth to a single pup. Uh, they won't give birth to any more. Uh, it's too much in terms of energy stocks. They'll put all their effort into bringing that single bat up, single baby up. Um, they, most of our uh, bat species will congregate into maternity roosts as well. So that's through a method. Uh, the reason why they do that is to avoid, um, to avoid uh, predatory uh, predators as well. Um, to gain warmth within the roost is quite important, particularly for our smaller bat species that lose body temperature very easily. So our pipistrelle bats will roost in quite large colonies. Um, and so do our brown long ear bats, like I mentioned before. Um, and then, yeah, the babies are parked into a, a creche, um, as described. This is basically consists of the maternity colony itself. Um, maternity colonies can um, change location as well. Um, if bats find that there's too many parasites within a certain uh, roosting location or there's too much disturbance, they will tend to have another roost um, opportunity elsewhere, um, just as an alternative to get away from the barracks, parasites or threat. And then, yeah, as I mentioned in the previous slide, within three weeks, uh, usually uh, they're able to fly. Um, a lot, many of our bat species will tend to practice their flight in protected areas. So the brown long-eared bats I mentioned earlier, they all tend to practice their flight in loft spaces. Um, so do pipistrelle bats as well. Um, so yeah, it's a very safe means of practicing their flight before 
they then enter the big world. So what can you do to help bats? Now, there's lots of things that you can do, one of which is planting and night flowering plant species. Now, a list of these species can be found on the um, Bat Conservation uh, Trust website. Um, they'll provide you with a, a long list of um, species that can be purchased on naturescapes.com um, or you can buy them from garden centres as well. The reason why they have to be night flowering is, of course, it attracts insects during the night, a concentration of insects during the night um, to provide a lovely dish of invertebrates for, for maybe bats that may or may not be within your, within your local area. Again, you can um, encourage unkept areas in your garden. So if there's like an area of bramble or nettle um, or maybe just like a, a tree, just an unmanaged tree or hedgerow, it might be worth just leaving it to grow if you can. Um, it would encourage a, a broader spectrum of invertebrate prey for the bats, which would definitely help them throughout the course of the year. Um, if you add a good diversity of uh, plant species within your garden or field or wherever it may be, uh, the more diversity of um, invertebrates you have, the more likely you're going to have a good distribution of them throughout the year. So you would have bees early in the year or solitary wasps later in the summer, for instance. And then log piles uh, more or less do the same thing, but for beetles. So beetle larvae are very good for beetle larvae. They turn into adult um, beetles, which then take flight, such as um, stag beetles and larger beetle species. Um, again, very good for nocturnal bats and our large bat species. Um, contributing to bee lines as well. I know this is predominantly for bees, but that can also work in line for other invertebrates as well, suitable for bats. And last but not least is putting up bat boxes. NHBS is a very good website for um, purchasing a, a broad diversity of, of bat boxes. Um, there's quite a few you can get from open chambered ones uh, to flat wooden ones that you can see in the pictures there. Each one will be suitable for different bat species. Those bat species will be described in NHBS as well. So just to give you an idea of what sort of species you would be using in those particular boxes. It's recommended that boxes are installed on trees or you can put them on the side of buildings, at least I would say two to three meters high. Um, the aspect of which doesn't actually necessarily matter because bats will use uh, roosts with different temperatures during the course of the year. So you might provide them opportunities for a mate uh, mating roost or a hibernation roost later in the year, um, or even a maternity colony that require warmer, warmer conditions. For instance, if you put a bat box on the uh, south facing side of a building. And light as well. Um, light is, you'll probably see that bats that you have seen at least have been foraging around lights, um, yeah, just light street lights, or even like your security light. Now, the reason why that is, is not because the bats like the light, it's because the bats attract, sorry, the light attracts the invertebrates, so the bats go after the, the light. Now, it's great for pipistrelle bats, but not our other more light sensitive species. What light will do as well are next to a woodland, it will draw the insect um, assemblage away from woodlands and tree canopies and also hedgerows um, and reducing the invertebrate assemblage for those bat species that require dark corridors. So you can turn off your lights. If you have security lights, um, you can deactivate them or put them on just sensors. Um, your, even your, um, the lights coming out um, from your lounge, that can be a small impact on some of our bat species. So just draw your curtains will, will definitely help or maybe have a candle at night if you can. Um, but yeah, there's lots of things that we can do for bats, um, particularly kind of more of our common bat species as well. And bringing back to rivers, it's very important that a lot of light spill is taken away from rivers being one of our most important uh, foraging um, foraging opportunities and also hunting opportunities. And from the 
photo on the right there, um, a cat, obviously nothing to do with lights. Um, cats are one of the main predators of bats. Um, the bats are local to me, actually, I've seen them capture young bats in particular. Um, bats that are particularly kind of inexperienced on the wing. So if you can, when you can, or if you want to, um, just to keep your cats in during the, during the night can actually make a big difference. Not only to bats, but also our other nocturnal species as well. So yeah, that's my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have any questions um, that go unanswered um, during this presentation, then just yeah, contact me on my email or give me a call. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Mark. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and we've got some great questions already. Um, yes. So now is the question time. So if you can think of anything that Mark hasn't covered, um, drop it in the question and answer function um, or a very generous offer, offer of an email him. And I know how busy this man is. <laughs> um, so um, I will address the first question uh, which um, is a very great very good question um, can you clarify the regulations with respect to deliberate or intentional killing and disturbing of bats I'm curious about things like wind farms and electrical lines and other industry actions that kill birds um, in the US, there is a big issue and hotly debated if companies are following the acts to protect those said birds, for instance, um, especially since there are things that they can do to prevent and minimize the kills. Are the actions of companies and industries considered just considered not deliberate and hence the regulations don't apply? Gosh, that's a question. Thank you very much for asking that. That's Mark, a, any uh, comment? <laughs> that's a very good question. To be honest, um, that sort of area is quite a grey area. Um, it's a matter of like proving whether it is a deliberate or a reckless action. Indeed, but when you do, when they do put up the um, bat, uh, sorry, the, the turbines, surveys have usually been undertaken of bats and their general commuting corridors. See where the bats have been flying. Um, when the turbines are put in, what usually happens is that consultants such as myself will design a level of mitigation or enhancement to encourage the bats to fly away from the turbines. Um, it, the turbines often as well do have a bit of lighting as well, so lighting itself can discourage them from using the turbines. So when they have uh, gone through the action of mitigation, then there's actually a very good solid um, effort for them of trying to mitigate against the accidental killing of those bats. But the long and short of it is they, that's not deemed as a reckless or deliberate action because they've already gone through the process of mitigation through a consultant. But I can assure you that turbines would have gone, particularly in the UK, would have gone through um, ecological surveys and a planning application with their associated ecologists to support that. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark. Um, that's a brilliant uh, question. Thank you for asking that. Um, right. We have um, a couple of questions in. Um, and if um, actually someone has just done it, but if someone has asked the question that you really want to, wanted to ask as well, and there is a thing called upvoting, so you can just like click the thumbs up and that will shoot that question to the top. Um, and as uh, people have upvoted, I love this question. Why do bats hang upside down? <laughs> I, I'm quite often asked that. Um, I mean, most of actually quite most of our bat species don't hang in the UK, but the ones that do, um, and the ones that don't, they still have their heads facing downwards. The reason why is because it's a good method of exit. So you can imagine all you need to do if you're hanging is release your feet, and then you're airborne instantly to get away from the predator. Um, or mm -hmm. as well, it's a, a good method of reducing the concentration of parasites as well. If you're sitting on a very flat surface without um, kind of hanging upside down, you do have a collection of parasites and dirt around you. The bats don't really want to be doing that. 
Um, they also do, it's an easier method um, of defecating as well, although they don't do it when they're hanging upside down, they tend to twist around and then defecate. Um, but yeah, there's lots of reasons why they do it. And it's a, a very good method for some of our bad speakers. Brilliant. I, I never knew that. Thank you so much for asking that question. I just didn't think to ask that. And that's fascinating. Absolutely brilliant. Um, right. Wonderful. We have a couple more questions coming in. Um, really interesting question here. Um, what is a licensed bat ecologist? Um, they say, um, I didn't know there were enough biologists specializing in bats uh, that a license would be required. We're learning all sorts tonight. Um, who are you licensed with and what are the requirements and what does it allow you to do that other ecologists cannot? Thank you. That's okay. Um, the license is supplied by Natural England, which is our national governing body uh, for wildlife legislation. Um, you have to be particularly experienced um, to get one of these licenses. Um, they do. There are different types of license for bats, but the one that I've got basically enables me to handle bats. Um, I can catch bats using a hand net. I can also enter roosts as well, known roosts, and shine lights, and um, yeah, just general handling and measuring their biometrics as well. It's all the stuff that I do for my work. Um, so if I do find that there is a bat roost within a loft space, then it's me that's only allowed in the lost space rather than someone who's unlicensed. Brilliant. And uh, actually, it, it was amazing what you were saying earlier um, about how many sort of houses have bats and we probably don't know it. That's yeah. quite scary, isn't it? <laughs> but great. It's scary, Sophie. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful. Well, I would be too scared of disturbing them accidentally. Um, because I know I have bats flying around our house between two gardens yeah. and I can't identify which house they're coming from. And it's every night. It's wonderful. Um, I just I'd be terrified of disturbing them. Absolutely terrified. Maybe I should invite you guys around. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Right. We have another question. Um, can you encourage bats in small gardens near large towns? Brilliant question. Thank you for ask, asking that. Yeah, you can. It doesn't matter where you are in the UK. You can always encourage them to come to you. Uh, bats have been recorded in the centre of London. They, in fact, they roost in the Houses of Parliament. So thinking that you're in an urban, urban area, no bats being there, it's, it's not right because they will be they will be in the near area. So if they are in the near area, then you can put bat boxes up, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, you can also, um, even small things like just enabling an area of unmanaged grass, just growing through, just to provide uh, the flowering heads that are suitable for invertebrates, which in the long run provide foraging opportunities for bats. So even the small, smallest of things that you can do will make a difference to um, the presence of bats in your area. That's brilliant, Mark. Um, actually, what you uh, can I ask a very cheeky question for um, our audience uh, watching tonight, and obviously on YouTube as well. Um, if you've got any sort of tips on and um, direct links to what you're saying, the nights flowering um, flowers and bat boxes and stuff like that, if you could send me a list of links and then I can attach it to the YouTube um video that would be brilliant okay, yeah not a problem wonderful uh right we have another question uh coming in um what signs can you see from outside a house that show a bat is in resident residence brilliant question again very good question i mean it's not the easiest if i'm honest but if you do happen to have say hanging tiles on your property you can look on the window ledges that are immediately below the hanging tiles and sometimes you might be able to find bat droppings. The way to find out whether it is a bat dropping or not, you basically pick up the dropping and squash it between your fingers. If it crumbles, then it's a bat and if it doesn't, then it's more likely going to be a small mammal. Um, so yeah, you can look out for that. You can look out for staining around gaps leading underneath the tiles. Um, I think it's probably the two main things that you will be looking out for in terms of externally for bats. 
Brilliant. I'm going to be investigating my next door neighbours' houses now just to see where these bats are coming from. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, if anyone has any more questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the qu uh, question and answer um, function again. Um, and just to say, I believe we have a few spaces left on the bat walk. Um, uh, when was it? Um, I'm losing track of this week. We've got so much on. Um, I think it was. I believe so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Tuesday, tomorrow night, uh, 7 till uh, 9 o'clock, uh, with my lovely colleague Emma Rothwell uh, at Noah Wood. Um, so if you do uh, want to attend that walk um, and you're a member of Surrey Wildlife Trust, um, get your place very quickly because these walks do book up. Um, or you can email me um, at sophie.code at surreywt.org.uk. Um, and we've got lots more things going on uh, this week. Um, as I said earlier, got water voles. Oh, water voles are amazing. So please do um, uh, come along and join us for uh, the talk by one of our um, one of Mark's colleagues in ecology services. Um, Very good. Excellent, excellent. Um, I can't see any more questions, um, but I wondered in your role as um, ecologist. What's the most interest, or what have been the most interesting circumstances where you have found bats roosting? Um, the most unusual place. Um, I've done a survey of the Houses of Parliament. Amazing. Yes, yeah, and they do have bats roosting there, so that was quite unusual. That's probably the most unusual place that I've seen them emerging from. Um, but the most unusual place that I've heard from others they've been roosting is actually in hanging baskets. <gasps> oh my goodness. You get searching your hanging baskets thinking they're going to be bats in there because probably not. But on occasion, you'll get a very inexperienced juvenile bat that is so desperate to find somewhere to roost. This one oh. in particular was found, yeah, like between the membrane and the compost in the oh, hanging wow. basket. <laughs> yeah. It's not just buildings and, you know, trees, and trees <laughs> hanging baskets as well. Amazing. So let's um, get out there and get some more bat boxes, people. <laughs> if there's one call to action tonight, it's um, get some bat boxes. <laughs> exactly. Uh, wonderful. Oh, uh, another question. Um, how can you encourage bats to avoid church towers? That's a very good question. To avoid church towers. Yes. Yeah, there's no real way of avoiding um, that. They can't really put any deterrent measures in. Um, they will quite naturally go towards um, your kind of towers anyway. They are quite a good area for roosting bats. Um, but again, if you do have a real concern of bats roosting within the churches, there is actually a Bats and Churches project that's run uh, by local bat groups. And I think Surrey Bat Group does it. Um, and they all inform you and they can actually visit um, your church if you do have concerns of any bats being present there. The likelihood is that they won't, they won't cause any trouble roosting bats. They'll keep well out of their way. And if it's the dung, if you do have bats that is, and you're worried about dung falling on, on your bed, you know, in the, in the nave of the, the church then there are ways of reducing that as well so yeah like i said just get in touch with your local bat group um, for any questions on that brilliant um wonderful i hope that answered your question um edward if not do do get in touch with us um or again your local bat group um wonderful if there's any more questions um just to see if uh, anyone else wants to ask anything. Well, it's been brilliant. It's so, so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed the talk. <laughs> that was fantastic. Um, right, I have no more questions coming in uh, right now. So um, to save everyone um, waiting, um, I'm going to draw this evening to a close. 
um, and thank Mark for a brilliant presentation. Um, I've learned so much tonight. I'm so grateful for your um, expertise and um, keep those stories coming because we'd love to find out more and maybe have another talk from you um, next next year for um, Rivers Week, maybe, if not before. Of course. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Um, as I said, this is um, the first event part of Rivers Week. So do go to our website to check um, out the rest of the events. Um, and I know some of you are members of Surrey Wildlife Trust and some of you have come here for the first time. So welcome and thank you very much for joining us and for your support. Um, uh, do consider joining if you would like. Um, you get access to lots of uh, amazing free events and discounts. Um, and you could even go to one of our adult education courses at Noah Wood and learn all about bat ecology and get really in depth and up close with um, bats. And I believe they do have um, obviously a licensed bat handler who teaches um, the course there as well and occasionally brings in um, a bat that he rescued um, and I believe you can't release it to the, into the wild which is an awful shame um, so do check out our website and uh, this is also part of Big Green Week um, so I am just posting a link in the chat now um, if you'd like to get involved um, please do um, take a look at the website um, and there's loads of events going on around uh, the UK uh, to celebrate Big Green Week or even create your own event. Um, you can invite friends around um, and log on to one of our seminars, have a um, drink or you could go on a litter pick or do anything in your local community um, or go out and buy some bat boxes. That would be a great thing to do for uh, Big Green Week. And if you do, let us know. Um, all right, I'm going to say goodbye. Uh, enough of my voice. Thank you again to Mark and thank you um, once again for everyone attending and hope to see you at future events. Bye, everyone. All right, thank you, guys.